Derek comes flying through the door, and I think he swallowed the burrito in about 63 seconds uh, in the living room. It was quite a, quite a show to see. Yeah, wow. It, didn't, like speed it didn't stand a chance. I just got out of the, <laughs> I just got out of the pool, and like, so I'm, I'm just like famished, hungry. Welcome to the Lost in Transition podcast. I'm your host, Chris Gerard. Fresh off the Teleco Olympic triathlon yesterday, it was a hot one. It went pretty well for me overall. Glad to see a lot of people out there. And uh, congratulations to our very own Lana Burrell, number two overall female yesterday. Saw her multiple times on the bike and the run, and she was looking really good yesterday. So congratulations to her. And one of these days, she will be back on the podcast. She must have been training to get a result like that yesterday. So we'll be welcoming her back to the podcast shortly. Derek Tingle joining me here in just a moment as well. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and now finally on Instagram. Instagram is so new that I have yet to put the logo up on it. Look for at Lost Transitions on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Facebook, just search for Lost in Transition Triathlon Podcast or something like that, and you'll probably find us just fine. Coming up next week, Patrick Morris is stopping by to talk about strength and conditioning and his recent ventures into triathlon. You know, strength is one of the things that just about all triathletes neglect. So we'll work to find ways to make it simple and helpful for you so it can become part of your routine and you can benefit from it. Today, we're talking to Lori Nadescu. She's a pro cyclist, elite marathoner, Instagrammer, lives out of a van that is amazing, retrofitted, and uh, just really interesting. And she makes amazing, nutritious food and takes pictures of it, uh, puts it up on Instagram, and has created quite a following there. You cannot look at her channel without getting hungry. And we'll talk to her about all of those things. And uh, also, she will be in Knoxville for our East Tennessee-based listeners at the USAC Pro Cycling Championships coming up next weekend. That is June 21st through the 23rd. Uh, so definitely look for her out there on the race course, racing for Welland Racing. We talk to her next on the Lost in Transition podcast. Lori Nadescu is a sports dietitian. She holds a master's degree in human nutrition and certification as a specialist in sports nutrition with over nine years experience in the wellness, fitness, and athletic style realm. She travels the world as an elite athlete and showcases her experiences through informative stories and eye-catching photography. She joins us on the podcast tonight. Lori, welcome to Lost in Transition. Hey, thanks. Super happy to be here. So a lot of people might follow your Instagram, The Cadence Kitchen, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about nutrition here in, in just a bit. But I know that uh, running has always been a real focus of yours. Was it the first thing you did athletically? Yeah, young. Um, when I was younger in high school, I did a lot of team sports, and I didn't really appreciate the solo endurance sport. So it wasn't until after college where I kind of just learned to love being out there by myself and I started marathon running and got into ultras, and it's definitely something that I love. Um, the runner's high is a real thing for me. Well, and it's something you took to, uh, it seems like, very well. You broke the three-hour marathon mark of the Rock and Roll DC uh, marathon in 2016. Was that something you were training to do, uh, or just something that uh, kind of came as a pleasant surprise on race day? You no, know, the three-hour mark is definitely a goal. I think for a lot of marathoners, that's a huge landmark. Um, so I was thrilled. That was my third sub-three that year. Oh, wow. So I was really excited to like keep that streak going. Um, and I've had four sub-threes total. So pretty happy with that. Yeah, I would be. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So also, you decided that a marathon wasn't enough and, and dipped your toes into Ultra 2, including the not-too-challenging Rim-to-Rim-to-Rim to rim to rim Ultra, which, <laughs> as I understand it, is going down one side of the Grand Canyon and back up and then back down and then back up. The thing that the National Park Service says, don't do this, people die doing this, you did Yeah, <laughs> you know, I didn't know that. Going, I, I went in blind, which is probably kind of a good thing because I yeah. might not have done it. Um, it was brutal. It was way more brutal than I expected. So how did you... Fun, but I don't want to go back to the Grand Canyon for a long time. Well, yeah. So, okay. So <laughs> this is Derek, by the way. Um, I gotta, you went in blind to the rim to rim to rim, but I mean, did, how did you train for that? Like, did, did you just kind of go out and just run a whole bunch or had you done some like trail running and stuff beforehand or, or like, you know, who talked mm -hmm. you into doing this crazy thing? 
Yeah, I didn't really train specifically for it. I, I was living in Columbus, Ohio at the time where it's pretty flat. Um, I had come out of a good marathon season, so I had a pretty good fitness behind me at that point. Um, really the training that I did going into it was more nutritionally. I would go out for 20 plus mile runs and make sure I could eat a sandwich during that time and really train my body to take in enough fuel. So I think that was super helpful. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I, I just, I just caught your latest blog post on, on sandwiches and, and so I, I love a good sandwich. We I've followed your Instagram for a while and I can tell that you enjoy sandwiches. <laughs> I too enjoy sandwiches. So I'm interested to hear like on, on the fueling with the sandwiches thing. Is that, is that just something you've always done or is this something that's kind of just come about, you know, over, over time that just something you found that works for you or how did you kind of get into that? Yeah, it just is something that works for me, and I think it can really work for anyone um, because they're so simple. You know, it doesn't take much to make a sandwich, so the prep aspect isn't really a big deal. They're portable, so you can put them in your jersey pocket to take on a cycling trip or in your bag, you know, to pack for running if you're going out on the trails or driving somewhere to do your workout. So I like the simplicity and also the ability to switch it up, and it's still a sandwich. So whether it's like turkey or a club or almond butter and banana, it's it's the same concept. You know, I just ate dinner and I'm still hungry. <laughs> it sounds, all sounds so good. <laughs> it brings up the question, though. You know, you see, as as I'm retracing your experience here, as you're describing it, uh, running was kind of that that first foray after the team sports that a lot of people do in in high school. And mm-hmm. uh, but you got into cycling competitively too. And I always see the cyclists grabbing sandwiches out of their you know jersey pockets in the feed zones and you know Tour de France and whatever. Uh, how did you get into competitive cycling? And uh, and was your nutritional choice is kind of influenced by that community uh with cycling your gut is a lot more stable so you can really take in a lot more diverse food and a lot more food in general um and it's just easy because you have somewhere to carry your food uh, as opposed to running where it's a little more difficult to carry a bulky item with you but with cycling you know it's just so much easier to take food with you so i think that really becoming a cyclist really opened up sports nutrition for me. Right. And, and that background is helpful. Now, as far as, you know, you're running, you're running, like you said, four sub three marathons. Uh, were you cycling at the time as well? Or was that something you kind of picked up uh, after that? No, I was cycling. Um, I was actually, it was my first big race season. And I had also done three competitive marathons. So it was my first sub three. And then I was able to do two more that same season um, in the fall. So I kind of took a break from the bike, ran during the fall through the winter, and then got back on the bike again. Um, This year I'm only doing cycling because it was very hard on the body to do that much competition and switch it up that much from cycling to running. Um, but I'm I'm feel myself missing the run right now. Yeah, I can imagine. It sounds like it sounds like what you you know you first got into, and that I always enjoy the run too, just because it's so simple. You know, you can put on a pair of shoes really and 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 go for it. And I love cycling. Cycling is what I started out with, and you know I love being able to cover you know sixty, eighty, a hundred miles, whatever. You know, you could never. It'd be hard to do that running. People do it, but um, you know, it's still it, running, putting on a pair of shoes and going is just really nice. And I, I can see where that simplicity is. It's kind of helpful for that. It it is nice. The so cycling gets a little more stressful with everything that you have to wear and pack and plan. Like the weather is a big factor and equipment has to be perfect. So yeah, when things go wrong on the bike, I'm like, well, I really just want to put my shoes on and go for a run yep. because it's so easy. Nice. So on the, on the, the subject of cycling, you are a U.S. or I guess uh, elite cyclist here in the States. You race Correct. for Welland Racing. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you focus on with them? Are you guys all road race? Do you race crit? Do you time trial? What, what, uh, what all focuses do you have? Um, as far as the team, we do it all. Um, I like stage races personally. So the longer the races, the more days included. Usually they have a few road races, a time trial and a crit. Um, my specialty is more with the climbing and races, especially that have a good finish climb. So this past weekend we did Johnson City, 
Omnium as a team, and that road race has an eight-mile finish climb. Nice. And that's something that I absolutely love. And that's Johnson City, Tennessee? Yes. Nice. That is right up the road from us here in Knoxville. So we know what these East Tennessee hills are like. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. So that was that's one of my favorite races. Um, Chattanooga has a really good race in August, too, that has a nice finish climb. Um, those are some of my favorites. Oh, and Chattanooga is, is like the regional hub for biking around here, both mountain and <laughs> It's a and gorgeous road. area. It's just... They've, they've outdone themselves in that. Of course, Knoxville hosting the USA Cycling Championships coming up here uh, on June. Oh, uh, just a couple, few, weeks couple weeks away. Weeks? I want to say 20th and 21st, but I'm pretty sure that was last year's date. So do not quote so me So I was that. just up there on Monday doing the hill. There's like a two-minute power climb in that course. Mm-hmm. So I was doing mm-hmm. some hill repeats on it, and it is a leg burner. Nice. It's a beast, isn't it? Is yeah, that- it's tough. I mean, it is steep and fast. Is that the Newbert Springs Hill, or was that from last year? Sherrod. Yeah, Sherrod. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. you Sher- know it. Sher- Sherrod's awful. <laughs> right? It's really, uh, really There's terrible. really no shortage nine, of awful nine, hills around nine here. Nine times. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good for you. That's <laughs> you messed know. up. Uh, it'll be fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I guess another question I have for you then is, uh, does your team fuel like you? Have you had any influence on the way that the team races and the way that the team fuels, or are they still all like chugging gels and carbs and everything like that while you're eating sandwiches on the bike? No, I definitely have an influence, um, which is great. Uh, You know, they ask me a lot of questions. They know I'm a good resource for that kind of information. And when I get to stay with the team, I definitely do some cooking so we had some good macro bowls last night when I was staying with a couple of my teammates, and I am cooking dinner right now for one of them. So they like to eat like me. Nice. What's for dinner? Uh, sprouted brown rice with some zucchini, roasted chicken, and salad greens. Nice. That sounds good. Yeah. Sounds much better. Sounds much better than my like burrito that I had a little bit. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to tell the backstory of the burrito now. So, so we're recording at the studio in, in my house and Derek comes flying through the door and I think he swallowed the burrito in about 63 seconds uh, in the living room. It was quite a, quite a show to see. It didn't didn't stand a chance. I just got out of the, (laughs) I just got out of the pool and like, so I'm, I'm just like famished, hungry. Swimming is one of the, you've done some swimming, right? You've done, you've done some try, right? I have, and I don't because I hate the swim so much. I can't <laughs> really goodness. swim. I just think it's a problem. But, <laughs> but like, you know how it's like you get out of the pool and like you immediately want to eat everything in sight. Like I can get yeah. off the bike and I can be okay for a few minutes, but, but I get out of the pool and it's like just anything that I see, I want to eat. It's, it's, it's awful. <laughs> Yeah, I think it has something to do with the position that the stomach is in, and it just kind of throws things off. Yeah, maybe. It, it, but yeah, it, it, that burrito didn't stand a bit of a chance <laughs> with me. It was gone. Um, and then, so I got to ask too. You, you talk about staying with with the the team. Um, one of the things that that you are big on. You live out of a van most of the time when you race, right? Yeah, I mean, in order to travel around and get to all the races that I want to do, I pack up, load up a van, and I sleep in that, and yeah, I get to go ride across the United States. That's awesome. So actually, that one of the first things I caught from you uh, on the Instagram feed was you did like a little video where you just like did a, a, a fast forward of packing the van. And I was mesmerized by this, like how you fit all that stuff in the tiny little van. It's just amazing to me. How long did it take you to get this going and figure out that you got the system down? I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, it took a little bit of practice. The first trip I did was definitely a learning experience. And from there, I just kind of learned. You learn quick because it's such a small space. So if things aren't super efficiently packed and in, and everything has to be where you can grab it when you need it, so it's it's very strategic, and you learn quickly what needs to go where and how much you can fit in. So I think I've done a really good job. It's pretty loaded. Yeah, I would agree. And like for those listening that that haven't seen the the Instagram feed or haven't seen Lori's, van, th- this is not like a Sprinter van we're talking about. This right, is not like a big diesel think. Sprinter. This is a tiny little like delivery van thing that yeah, you're it's living a full out of. Transit. It is basically the smallest van you can 
call a van. It's tiny and it's not the extended version. So it is like good thing I'm five six and not five seven or I might not fit. Like, it's <laughs> oh, down to every inch. And then when you when you're traveling with the van, I, you know you've got the sink and your little prep area there for the food. But I, I didn't see anywhere to cook anything. So are you are you prepping stuff like, you know, in hotels with the with the, the team or are you prepping stuff before you go? How does that work out for you? Yeah, anytime I get an opportunity in a host house or if I'm in a hotel, I prep as much as I can. I do have like camp cooking equipment. So I've got a jet boil and a little um, camp skillet. So if I'm camped out somewhere for a few days, I can definitely utilize that. Um, otherwise I try to keep it pretty simple. There's a lot of granola and sandwiches and, you know, soup and protein shakes and bars. Um, because every time you cook, there's also a lot of dishes involved. So (laughs) everything becomes a process. Gotcha. And I'm, the reason I'm kind of probing into all this is because, uh, I started last year, um, basically like car camping for a lot of the, the off-road, the Xterra stuff, and even some of the road Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I've got a roof tent on the forerunner and, and so I'm kind of, kind of doing the same thing, just not quite to the extent that you're doing and not nearly to the, the duration that you're doing. I'm doing like one or two nights maybe. Um, but are you, when you, when you find out where you're staying, are you staying like campgrounds or are you doing just like Walmart parking lots or how does that work? Mostly it's parking lots because a lot of the times I'm point to point, you know, trying to get from one race to the next yeah. race and, Um, Like the last block I did going from Alabama to Arkansas to New Mexico to California, all in four weeks. So you're really, yeah, it was rough. And you're going from point to point and putting a lot of miles in. Um, So it was parking lots. Usually Whole Foods is my parking lot of choice. There you go. It's got Wi-Fi. You You know, it's usually a safe parking lot. Um, Starbucks works sometimes. Welcome centers are good, too. Um, if I have a little bit of extra time and can really like spend time in one area, I was in Killington last summer for Green Mountain and Killington Stage Race. So there it was a campsite, which was really fun. It's always nice to stay put for a few days. Yeah, I can imagine. And it makes me wonder, so you talked about four weeks uh, on the road. What's What's your longest stretch that you've gone without a traditional house and a traditional yeah. bed? <laughs> Um, I think five nights, oh, which is rough. Uh, okay. Like five yeah. nights is a is a good stretch. I don't think I could go more than that um, because right. things get you know things get dirty and grimy, and it's Be- it's nice to have the comfort of a home. Oh, certainly, I can imagine. <laughs> but for getting through the short stretches and place to place, yeah, that's a really ingenious solution. And I know that uh, I, I had read that your dad did a lot of the retrofitting on that. What all? How all did the van, I guess, start? You know, even the idea for it, for that matter. And then, what kind of improvements were made to make it uh, livable as it is? Yeah, it, he did so much of the work. My dad and my boyfriend really worked on it. I just kind of directed and was like, I have two bikes. I need to sleep and kind of pointed to how I needed to live life and how that would work for me. And they put it together and did the wiring. So we took the um, bike clamps, I guess you'd say, off a car rack, off a roof rack, and secured those onto like a, a shelf in the van so there's storage underneath. I can hold my TT bike and my road bike. There's a cooler that can plug in to the solar power that I have, which is amazing because I can charge my computer because I'm working on the road. So I've got to be able to have a phone and have a computer and plug in the cooler and have cold food. Um, The pump sink is really essential for being able just to brush my teeth and wash some dishes. I've washed clothes in it so (laughs) comes in very (laughs) handy um and then just like the extra storage of the shelf unit and some extra netting magnets kind of utilizing all the space that i can that's that's really cool the way that you've got that thing set up um you talked about working on the road let's talk a little bit about the cadence kitchen and you know how do you balance that work schedule with training and you know road life and all that stuff It gets hard. Um, Definitely have to pinpoint, you know, where I can stop for a little bit and do some work, sit at a cafe or just 
sit in the van and put the computer up and do some writing. When I'm home, I definitely do as much content as I can, take a lot of photos, get as many articles, like at least half written. So I have things to pull from and the work seems less stressful when I'm on the go if it's already started. So try to try to do as much prep as I can. But otherwise, I mean, I've, I've got to work. So it's definitely a priority to keep it going. But the the journey really fuels it. So it kind of transforms the story of the Cadence Kitchen, the Instagram feed, the posts that I blog about, the recipes, you know, during the winter when I'm at home are a lot more in depth for a normal kitchen. And when I'm on the road, it's kind of like, here's how to throw the sandwich together or the salad together super quickly, um, which is kind of fun. It gives it a different content and, you know, just a different interest level. Yeah, definitely. Um, Your latest article, I think it was your latest article, was the Hydration Basics article, or maybe that was two articles ago. Um, But Mm -hmm. it obviously seems very well-timed, being as it's now summer. And here in East Tennessee, we skipped spring entirely. I think we had a day or two at most of actual real spring, and then it went straight to a million percent humidity and like 90 degrees. Um, Talk us through a little bit about that. Let's let's get some advice on on hydration and and how you hydrate and and uh, keep everything nice and happy through uh, hot racing seasons. Yeah, I mean, it's hydration is an issue year round, but we tend to think about it more in the summer, obviously, because it is hot, and when we're sweating more, our thirst sense kicks in more. Um, so it's definitely good to get that refresher on it and make sure that you're drinking enough. The biggest thing, if you're not hydrating enough during your workouts, it really makes you suffer for the recovery aspect. And I think that's mm-hmm. the point a lot of people miss. They're able to get through the workout without consuming enough fluids and say, like, well, I did it, I performed well. But if you're trying to perform day after day, it'll really add up and it really takes away from how much you can, you can keep going strongly. So, you know, you're talking about uh, racing and all the different experiences that you've had and, and also trying to run a business on the side and writing and traveling. And you've done you've done it all. Like you said, even dabbled in triathlon before you were smarter than us and decided that three sports is way too many. <laughs> and you're down to one. You know how nice it sounds to be down to one sport? You know, I mean, I, well, I did I that. Did I, I couldn't handle ones. it. Oh. Triathlon. Oh, it's too oh. much for me. I, I don't blame you. I feel I'm going for my first full in about 11 weeks and I'm feeling that more and more like why in the world why couldn't i just do one thing poorly <laughs> instead of three i, I, oh, I wow. told you iron no, man was good done luck with I that. I mean, to... that's so impressive yeah. i always had it as a goal and after doing two halves i i gave up on that i was like that was a good call me. yeah that was, that was a good call <laughs> way way smarter way way smarter uh but you know you've you've done different events and, and so we would look at the biking and the running and, and we can leave the triathlon out of this because obviously you know that that's uh that was something that was uh you know wasn't in your wheelhouse per se, but, but biking, I know you've already mentioned, uh, climbing stage racing and climbing running. Was it most of the marathoning that you enjoyed or, uh, you know, longer distance stuff for the most part, or what kind of favorite events have you, have you done? Definitely the marathon would be my favorite. I'm an endurance athlete all the way. It doesn't matter what sport you throw me in. I, if you ask me my mile time, it would be a split from a, a full marathon. Right. I don't have, a mile time. I'm not a sprinter. I'm not a short distance runner. Um, you know, I, I can go out and do a 5k, but it'll probably only be slightly faster than a marathon time. Right. Um, half marathon is the same. Like I'd, I'd rather just do double the distance. I'm better the longer I go. Um, so I did one fifty miler and, um, then the rim trim to rim and a 50 K. I think that's the extent of my ultra <laughs> running. But Still. I love it. Like, I enjoyed every mile. Oh, yeah. And and it sounds like, you know, and this is often common with endurance athletes, that the, the more difficult it is, the better we tend to lock in and focus and just grind it out and get it done. And I, I have to imagine, you know, you've raced all over the country in different places. What are some of the worst conditions, whether it be weather or race-related or whatever, that you've ever had to face up against? And uh, And how did that go? Oh, goodness. Um, definitely the hardest event was rim to rim to rim, hands down. Mm-hmm. The heat was something I wasn't expecting. Um, the terrain, it was just absolutely brutal. For cycling, I experienced hypothermia in France coming down one of the mountains. 
and that was brutal. Um, so definitely learning to be prepared is <laughs> a big thing. The, the further you're going and the more you're putting yourself out in the elements, like you've got to be prepared because anything can happen. Which, uh, which mountain were you, uh, were you careening down when you got the, It was uh, cold Agnel. Oh, wow. So in the French Alps, and it's like a, it's a really long climb. I think it's like 16 miles. And oh, so geez. climbing up was great, but you, you start at the bottom and it's like 80 degrees and you get to the top and it's like 37 and raining <laughs> and then you start going down and I was just, and no one yeah, was at the top to hand you it. some newspapers to shove down your Jersey or anything. Oh, there's nothing. I mean, it's <laughs> like little villages with, you pass like some cobbles and some chickens, but there is nothing. And I got to the bottom and just could barely, I think I descended slower than I rode up it because I was shaking so hard I couldn't control the bike. So I was just like on the brakes the whole time just trying to not fall over. And we got to the bottom in this little cafe and I was so excited to get coffee, but coffee in France is like a shot of espresso. Right. So right. I have this photo <laughs> and it's like a table with 20 shots of espresso <laughs> just to try to warm up. It's hilarious. Oh my goodness. Oh man, that's, I could see that. That's, oh gosh. I don't envy that at all, but I do envy the riding over there because I, I, that's one of the things I want to go so bad. Oh, it's uh, gorgeous. The yeah, best riding I've ever done. Yeah, definitely, definitely want to get over there and try some of those climbs. Cause I, I enjoy climbing. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. I'm not that good at it. Like, I mean, I'm not a, a power climber, but I do enjoy it. You know, it's, it's one of those things. It's just such an accomplishment when you get, when you get to the top of a big climb and and you can just sit there and, and kind of go, yeah, I did that. You know, I, I love that. And I think those, the, the epic switchbacks in some of the Alps and, you know, in the Pyrenees and stuff over there would just be amazing to do. Yeah, and it's nice. Like, I love the longer the climb, the better, because you can just settle into your rhythm Mm -hmm. and just grind it out. And I started riding a bike as cross-training to running when I lived in Florida, and we didn't have hills. And I remember the first hill was like a baby hill. It was nothing. And I was complaining so much. (laughs) I was whiny. I was like, what? I have to shift. Like, what is this? And I was riding next to a former pro that happened to be on the ride. And he's like, you know, the faster you get to the top, the faster it's over. And I will never forget those words. And I, <laughs> every time I go to do a climb, I'm like, the faster I get up it, it's done. So words to live by, just get it done. Right, definitely. Um, but that's, that's really, really cool. Um, so as far as your, we've talked about your racing experience. We've talked about the Cadence Kitchen. We've talked about running. Anything else out there that, that you want people to know about you that's just, you know, hey, this is who I am, this is what I do, you know, shine on. Tell us a little bit, you know, that why people should follow you and and go from yeah, there. Yeah, um, you know, the Cadence Kitchen was started as just kind of a way to showcase a high cadence lifestyle and, and to have good energy and performance and whether that's doing a – you know, CrossFit class or cycling a hundred miles or whatever it may be that, you know, you're into, it's good to fuel your body to be able to accomplish those things. And I will just love showcasing that in a fun way and in a way that's doable and approachable. Um, and it's, it's great and it fuels me. So it's not just like me putting the information out there, but the Instagram account and the social media aspect has been really awesome for my personal journey because people will reach out wherever I am along the way and say, Hey, try this restaurant or there's this hill to go climb or people will comment like, Oh, you inspired me to do such and such, or I ordered this product and love it. Um, so it's, it really goes both ways. And I think that's what keeps it going and keeps it super fun on my end. Um, and it's just, you know, it's my passion. It's what I do. I, it's, it's very authentic. So it's not like just an Instagram account. Like this is my real life. This is how I really believe you should eat to be fit and to be healthy and well. And I want to inspire you to do that. So it's, it's a really fun process and journey. And your description of the foods and pictures of them are just absolutely, oh, just 
it makes me want to eat way more than I should. <laughs> you gotta have the photo. Like, that's uh, you know, what I and, learned and early on. Like a good photo is key. It makes all the difference. And people can follow you on your Instagram account for all of that. And also at, is it thecadencekitchen.com? Correct. Perfect. And what's coming up on your race schedule for 2018? What's the next uh, next big thing for you? Or what are you going for as your, your kind of A race for this year if you've got one? Um, I'm headed to D.C. tomorrow to do the Armed Forces Classic over the weekend, which is not an A race for me, but I'll be helping out my team. It's a crit race Saturday and Sunday. But the next big thing for me and really my key event will be Pro Nats in Knoxville. Awesome. So I'll be down there at the road race, and I'm really excited for it. Well, you know, if we would have just waited a couple of weeks, we could have done this live, but that's okay. <laughs> right? We'll be looking forward to seeing you and, and all of our Knoxville area listeners. Be sure to come out and check out the uh, USAT Pro Nationals here in Knoxville and uh, cheer on Lori and everyone else. And, and they uh, are looking for volunteers. They are, yeah, they always so. need volunteers. So oh, definitely. yes, please volunteer. We love volunteers. It's so helpful. Definitely get into that. So we'll be looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, once again, the website is thecadencekitchen.com. And at Instagram, it's at thecadencekitchen. Um, and you're on Facebook uh, as well, Twitter, I think, P- Pinterest. Yeah, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's just at Cadence Kitchen. Perfect. All right. Keeping well, it nice and simple. We'll link those nice. up in the show notes, too, for people to follow you and get to know more about you. And Lori Nadescu, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Our thanks again to Lori Nadescu, and be sure to cheer her on at the USAC Nationals coming up. Uh, the weekend after next here in Knoxville if you're going to be in the area and we've linked up all of her social media and websites from the show notes at our website losttransition.com go on over there and check out all the show notes and past episodes you can subscribe rate and review in many different places and we do love those ratings and reviews as they come in Uh, just helps us reach more people out there and uh, makes the hard work pay off for us we really appreciate when you do that, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. As soon as I finish recording this, I'm going to put a logo at least on our Instagram page so we look a little more legit. Uh, we've got a ways to go to catch up with Lori. She's got such a great channel over there. And as a reminder, Patrick Morris are coming by next week. We'll talk strength and conditioning. Be sure to check out our recent episodes as well, including Kristen Seymour of the Fit Bottom Girls, Andrea Kendrick, nutritionist and dietitian, and elite masters runner Pete McGill talking about how to run faster all of those recent shows and stuff further back in our archives all the way back to the founding is available via your podcast app or losttransition.com for Derek Tingle I'm Chris Gerard until next time may all your transitions be smooth